Welcome to the Cooking Odyssey. On today's episode, I will be making for you a lagostifado, a hearty rabbit stew, followed by a spanakoprasopita, a twist to the classical Greek spinach pie. And we'll finish it off with a mustalevria, a wonderful dessert made of grape must. But in the meantime, let's go to Greece to find the source of inspiration for today's recipes. After several weeks of traveling through Greece, I knew it was time to visit the region made for the gods, full of legend, full of wonder, and full of a deep-rooted history. Welcome to Mount Olympus. My first stop was at the base of Mount Olympus, a small town called Klitochoro, also known as the gate to the gods' residences, because of its proximity to the mountain. Almost every climbing route starts in the southwest part of Litochoro and therefore the town is a popular destination for hikers wishing to trek to the top. In Greek mythology, Olympus was the home of the 12 Olympian gods of the ancient Greek world. Legends say the mountain was created after the gods defeated the Titans during the war and soon thereafter the Olympians inhabited the palace. Homer wrote in his epic poem The Odyssey Olympus was not shaking by winds, nor ever wet with rain, nor did snow fall upon it, but the air is outspread clear and cloudless, and over it hovered the radiant whiteness. Mount Olympus has 52 peaks and its highest, called Mythicas, rises 9,750 feet and it's the highest peak in Greece. Climbing Mount Olympus is not a technical hike, except for the final section from Scala Summit to Mythica Summit. It is estimated that 10,000 people climb the mountain each year. Most of them, however, don't make it to the top. Travelers attempting to see as much of Greece as they possibly can in a short period of time normally complete the hike in just one day. The mountain itself is majestic. It's easy to see why people come here to find themselves while in the forests of this great mountain. I was lucky enough to stumble upon a farm while walking around the mountain. Timafaki, with its large gates and welcoming farmhouse, seemed like a perfect place to visit. While at Timafaki, I took the opportunity to ask the owners to show me a local recipe. I am here with Vivi and her daughter Angeliki from Timafaki, and they're gonna show me how to make lagostifado, rabbit and onion stew, a traditional dish from Olympus. Stifado is a long-established Greek dish that I grew up eating. While everyone has their own variation of stifado, the basic recipe is the same and it is always good. Customerly made during the winter and around the holidays, this dish is perfect for family gatherings and cold winter days. While cooking with Vivi and Agiliki was so much fun, it was time to move on to our next destination. But don't worry if you didn't catch how to make stifado. Yanni will walk you through the whole process so that your dish looks as delicious as mine. Welcome back from the glorious Mount Olympus, a place of great history and inspiration. I'm very excited right now because I'm going to be making for you a rabbit stew. And for the ingredients, we have a full rabbit, which I have gutted, cleaned in vinegar and cut into large pieces. And this has been marinating overnight in a cup of red wine and half a cup of olive oil. In that marinade, I've added some bay leaves, peppercorn, and allspice. Allspice is one of my favorite spices. It's sort of a combination of cinnamon, nutmeg, and clove. Very popular in Greece and very popular in Turkey as well. And in addition to that, I've got three tomatoes which I've grated small pearl onions here, olive oil, pepper, and four cloves of garlic. So let's get going. First thing is to coat our Dutch oven with some olive oil. Next, add our onions. Beautiful. You're looking to brown all sides of the onions. There we go. This is a lovely dish to do on a Sunday. You have a little time, invite friends over. Mm -hmm. 
Next step is to brown the meat. So let's set that off to the side. Get this platter. Got my rabbit here. Let me get some towels. We want to uh, shake off the, the liquid, the marinade, and then we'll add it right back to this same pot. I will add more olive oil and just take each piece. Let the marinade soak off. The olive oil is nice and hot. Time to begin browning. Okay. There we go. You want to get that nice crust on both sides of the meat. Carefully turn it over. Uh, this process takes about five, six minutes. I uh, think we just need a little more olive oil. Let's add the rest of them. A few of them are actually done, so I'll remove them carefully into this bowl. Brown the other side for each of those pieces. We'll remove all of them and then we'll deglaze uh, the pot with our extra marinade here. Now you have all this goodness at the bottom of the pan. This is where all the flavor is going to come out. And so you have this uh, spice sack which you just want to throw away. We'll deglaze the, this with uh, the extra marinade that we have. And let the alcohol cook off. It just takes one minute. We'll add our uh, rabbit back into the pot with a little water and cover it for about an hour. Medium high heat until it's nice and tender. Well, let's check this out. I think we're halfway there. Looks gorgeous. Beautiful. Now it's time to add the rest of the ingredients. I'll add my onions. Very nice. Next, my tomatoes. Very nice. Got my four cloves of garlic here. Set that right there. A few black peppercorns. A few allspice, bachari. Let's season it a bit with some salt. Three good pinches, good. And three bay leaves. And the last ingredient, freshly ground pepper. Let's get generous with it. Great, let's give it a good mix. Cook it for about one more hour or until it's fork tender, then it is done. In the meantime, Eva told me about this beautiful vineyard she visited back in Rapsani. Let's check it out. In Rapsani, on the mountain where Dionysos, the ancient Greek god of the grape harvest, winemaking and wine resided, so does the Tsandali winery. Over 100 years ago, in 1890, the Tsandali family began making wines in eastern Thrace eventually expanding to Rapsani. Evangelos Tsandalis established the company out of a deep respect for the land's beauty and his strong commitment to quality. But it wasn't until his visit to Mount Athos that he decided to resurrect the monastic vineyards and traditions of its wines. By the 18th century, wine production was the main occupation of the people of Rapsani village and its namesake wine. Interested in learning more about the Tsandali wines, I met with Pericles Dracos, the director of exports for Tsandali wines, for a tour of the vineyard. Why is Tsandali's wines here in Rapsani? Well, because the location is, is unique. Rapsani is very famous for, uh, as a wine producing region for red wines. Mm -hmm. Tsandali Vineyards is evidently vast, so I wanted to know why they needed so much space. Rapsani region stresses from 250 meters above sea level up to 800 meters. Wow. 
Yeah, from the lower part, we produce the regular, Rapsani regular. But from the upper level, we produce the Rapsani Grand Reserve. So while I understood why Chandrali Wines was here, what I really wanted to know was what made these wines so special. What makes this place unique is that these, the grapes, the three grapes that, we, that are used in the blend of the Rapsani wine are blended in the field. And this is a great example of what I meant. This is a Stavroto grape, okay? This is Crasato, and this is Xinomavro. The three grape varieties are blended together in the same field. And these grapes, the Stavroto and the Crasato, are grown only in the region of Rapsani. Tandali wine in the Rapsani region is designated as PDO, Protected Designation of Origin, meaning that this wine can only be produced in this specific region. After learning so much about the vineyard and walking around in the hot sun, it was finally time to try Rapsani wine. First up was the Rapsani. This wine has a bright ruby color and seductive bouquet of spices and dried fruits. Next was the Rapsani Reserve, which tasted more like blackberries and plums. And last was the Rapsani Grand Reserve, which was the smoothest of all the wines and had aromas of licorice, fruit cake and olives, an odd combination but extremely delicious. While the wines were exquisitely delicious, it was definitely time to eat. And Pericles was kind enough to invite us to stay for lunch. And so, all together, crew and all, we sat down for a meal at Tandali Vineyards in Rapsani. Well, the moment of truth is upon us. It's taste time. Oof, it looks incredible. It smells amazing. Let's give it a taste. Heavenly, this is incredible. Hearty, beautiful tastes. What did you say about a Spanakoprasopita? You gotta wait for that because it's dessert time. And I'm going to make for you something called Musa Levria. In essence, it's grape pudding. The primary ingredient is petimezi. Essentially, this is a syrup which you get when you cook down freshly squeezed grape juice. In addition to this, we have half a cup of flour, some walnuts, a bit of sugar, sesame, and some cinnamon. Process is pretty straightforward. We just take our petimezi, add it to a pot here. If you have a small saucepan, it works just as well. And we'll bring this to a boil. It's nice and thick. I'll just get a spoon here, or a spatula, even better. And just get the rest of it in there. Now you want to boil this for five to seven minutes and then we'll add our flour. It's starting to boil and add two spoonfuls here, maybe three. Okay. Let me get a fork now and break this. Okay. And I'm gonna add this back into the pot. Good. And slowly add it back in here. This will prevent clumping from happening. Add it all in there. Very nice. I've got a little sugar, which I'm going to add to sweeten it. And we'll just stir and bring it back to a boil. Keep whisking until you get a really thick texture and then we'll pour it out into bowls. But you wanna keep stirring, otherwise it's gonna clump up. I think our pudding is done. I'll get four bowls and get a ladleful. Carefully pour this into each bowl. You want to let this cool down, but we'll add our toppings, our walnuts. A bit of sesame. Okay. 
and add a little cinnamon. Beautiful, that's it. And as these guys cool down, I'm going to get ready for my final promise, Spanakopra Sopita. After hearing so much about Rapsani's wine while at the vineyard, I wanted to see the village itself and the people that made it all happen. Here, the people are very friendly and hospitable, and I was invited to meet with a few of the women later in the day so they could share some of their local recipes with me. I was even offered tipuro and was told a few jokes as I explored the town. When I met with the women to talk about the local recipes of Rapsani, they decided to show me one firsthand. Spanakopita is made throughout Greece, and while it is primarily made with spinach and feta, there are many variations based on each region of Greece, the ingredients available and its homemaker's creativity. Mrs. Ikonomu adds milk to her mixture, which she says her secret to a light and creamy pie. As I watched Mrs. Ikonomu open the filo dough by hand, I was in awe at how effortless she made it look. In almost no time at all, she had several seeds made for her pie. Even in today's busy life, filo dough is almost never store-bought in Greece. Our final recipe for today is going to be a spanakopra sopita. You probably have heard of spanakopita, spinach pie, but to this we're going to add a very special ingredient, leek. I love it. It's a relative of onion and garlic, has a milder flavor to it, and it just heightens everything. Our ingredients include baby spinach washed and chopped, crumbled feta, sliced leeks, chopped green onions, three eggs, very nice aromatic dill that's also chopped, some salt, extra virgin olive oil, pepper, and of course, filo. So let's get started. First things first, I want to saute my leek and onion. So take some olive oil here, coat the bottom of a pan, add a little bit actually of pepper to the oil. And that brings out the flavor of the pepper uh, in a much more prominent way. And let this heat up a little. Let's add our leek. All right. You're just looking to saute it. You don't want it to get too brown. Let the flavors come out of the leek. The leek is softening up. Time to add in our onions. Smells wonderful. Let's uh, add a few pinches of salt. The feta cheese is already salted, so you don't need too much. Perfect. Let's turn this off and let's add this to our bowl of spinach here. Next step is to add our feta. Just right in there. Beautiful. And we've got our dill. I'm gonna add two whole bunches. There we go. One final ingredient to add to the mix is some eggs. Just lightly beat them. And just add this in here. This gets a little messy. Just mix it up. This is a beauty. So now what we have is the assembly of the pie. Let's put this to the side. Get this right here set up for us. And we've got our filo. Roll out our filo. And we're going to put a nice coat of olive oil at the bottom of the pan. Let's just brush the bottom. Okay. We'll add 10 layers to the bottom. Mixture, 10 layers on the top. Each layer, we brush olive oil. Good. 
don't worry if it starts drying out just a little, it's fine. So I have 10 layers at the bottom. I'll just add in my mixture. Let's finish off the layering. Final step is to cut this into squares before we pot it in the oven. Time to bake this. I've been preheating my oven at 350 degrees. We'll get this in there for 45 to 55 minutes and keep your eye on it. My pie is done. Get myself a nice big piece. This is a total winner, beautiful. It's creamy, wonderful texture with the feta and the mixture with the spinach and the leeks, the sweetness of it. I hope you enjoyed our recipes today and we'll see you on the next episode of The Cooking Odyssey. Join us for the next episode of The Cooking Odyssey where we visit a popular winter destination of Greece, see how the local cheese called formaella is made, and we cook with the locals.